welcome everyone to our Technology Earth webinar series here at Triple Ring Technologies. Uh, I'm Sheila Hamami. I lead the Environment and Sustainability Business Unit, and I'm speaking to you from our office in Boston. Uh, Triple Ring's longstanding mission is to improve human health through innovative technologies. And we all now recognize that human health is completely intertwined with having a healthy planet. So applying our capabilities to a healthy planet is a natural extension of our mission. And this webinar series is, is a natural expansion for us. In this series, we convene world experts and technologists working on a variety of environmental challenges to frame the problems and the challenges of scale up, and also to discuss and provide examples of viable solutions. Our goal is to connect individuals working in these problem spaces with the innovation ecosystem that we work in that has successfully delivered so many life-changing solutions in the biotech space. So I'm very glad that you're all joining us today. Uh, before we start, I'll mention just a little bit about logistics of our webinar. Uh, please pose your questions in the Q&A box via Zoom. Uh, the questions will be moderated. We'll take a few questions after each speaker, and then we'll open to the entire panel at the end. So today, our topic is illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing and digital and hardware solutions to combat this challenge. We'll hear from three speakers with three unique perspectives on the problem. And I'll start off by introducing our first speaker, Admiral Tim Gallaudet. He'll introduce and frame the problem for us, bringing to the problem his background. He holds a PhD from Scripps Institution of Oceanography. He's currently the CEO of Ocean STL Consulting, and he retired from 32 years in the US Navy, um, retiring at the end as its oceanographer. He also served as acting administrator of NOAA and undersecretary of commerce. And while leading NOAA, he secured the White House release uh, of an executive order to combat IUU fishing. So with that, I'd like to turn things over to you, Admiral Gallaudet. Thank you, Sheila. It's great to be here. And I'm really excited to join uh, this great group of speakers. Uh, let me pull up my presentation, please and do a check with you to make sure you see it okay. How does that look, Sheila? Looks great, thank you. Okay, uh, well, first off, uh, this is a global problem that affects our environment and our economy and national security. So let's just talk about this. First off, really can't talk about illegal fishing without talking about China because they are by far the worst actor in this space. And you can read some of the statistics here. Uh, just when I was with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, uh, we were beginning to see this problem in 20, really before I joined in 2017. In fact, I was at the State Department's Our Oceans Conference in 2015, where we were talking about illegal fishing being a global problem. And China was just beginning to take on this leading role of the worst actor in the space. You can see this 800,000 vessels in their fishing fleet. A large part of that fleet is a distant water fleet operating near Africa, across the Pacific and in South America, going into other nations EEZs and really decimating their fish stocks. So this is major losses to our allies in, in those regions in terms of uh, economic contributions of fisheries. So it's a real significant problem here. Now, uh, in 2020, when I was the deputy administrator of NOAA, uh, I, ha I kind of call the slide, it was this bad. And what I mean by that is I was at an event uh, and this event was releasing the Coast Guard's illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing strategic outlook. On this slide on the very left is the com then commandant of the Coast Guard, uh, four-star Coast Guard Admiral Carl Schultz. In the middle, is another friend of mine, four-star Admiral Craig Fowler, then U.S. Southern Command Commander. And I was on the right there as Assistant Secretary of Commerce. So you had two four-stars at the table, one a combatant commander, one a service chief, and me as a Assistant Secretary at this event, all describing how illegal fishing is a national security problem, or was back then. Uh, that's, that's the significance of this problem, is you have those level of individuals in the government uh, announcing that we need to do more about it. And they were all contributing, both the Commandant and the Southern Command Commander, uh, on an effort to attack and combat illegal fishing. Now, today, 
it's even getting worse. And I mean China as the bad actor. Just yesterday, the Solomon Islands denied entry uh, uh, entry into port of a Coast Guard cutter. And today, the Solomon Islands announced blocking all Navy ships. Why? Because China is shelling out a lot of money for infrastructure improvements in that country. And they have decided to align with China, despite the fact that China is ravaging the, the, the fisheries in that region. So this is really significant. Now, it isn't just China, by the way. And earlier this year, I, not, I put out an op-ed in the Hill talking about the illegal fishing that China, pardon me, that Russia is exercising um, around the Pacific. And so it is a, a serious problem and by these countries that are antagonists to the US and our allies. Now, more about the problem, uh, just within the US, our, the seafood that we consume, 90% of it is imported. And 11% or maybe more are probably derived from illegal fishing. And the problem is it's so, illegal fishing is very difficult to detect. And we'll talk about the technologies we are gonna use and are using to, to identify it and combat it and trace it. Uh, but it's, it's a that's a big challenge. It's really just determining how much is happening, where it's happening, and who is doing it. And most of our partners lack the technology, the, the hardware and software, to effectively detect and deter it. And really, this is where the U.S. can really up its game by helping our allies and taking a more leading role in, in the technology solutions there. And let me just quickly, quickly talk about a few of them to tee up our future speakers. First off, in addition to technology, there are policy solutions. And as Sheila, Sheila mentioned at the beginning to introduce me, uh, NOAA did release a seafood executive order to advance American seafood competitiveness in 2020. And combating illegal fishing was a major part of it. And just recently this year, uh, implementing some of that executive order actions was rulemaking uh, part of the High Seas Drift Net Moratorium Act uh, that NOAA is, is executing today to further combat illegal fishing and forced labor in the seafood supply chain. And that was a really welcome development to me because it was stemming from that executive order. Next, uh, partnerships. And at the end of my tenure at NOAA, we signed an agreement with USAID to help build the fisheries enforcement capacity of our allies, especially in the Pacific. And then there's the technology, which we're kind of focusing on today. And just a few things that we launched when I was with NOAA in 2020 was this partnership with Paul Allen's Vulcan, where we developed an AI enabled uh, detection capability using automated information service to identify regions of illegal fishing. And we were using it in the Gulf of Guinea. And just recently, uh, I published an article in The Hill about other innovation that's happening using space-based technology with an edge computing company called Exospace, who's working with an NGO in Thailand to help Thailand enforce illegal, combat uh, illegal fishing and enforce their fisheries management. This is the key technology enabler. There's a lot of space-based efforts to detect fishing, but the key thing is acting upon it in time that will allow fisheries enforcement to actually catch the culprits. Normally the latency, latency in ground-based processing present, prevents that, but by using edge computing with AI algorithms on orbit, on the satellites themselves, that is going to help uh, reduce that latency, latency and actually catch the bad actors while they're acting. Okay, well, I'll just conclude there and say that this is really important for our American fishing industry, recreational and commercial. I am with my oldest daughter, Fort Lauderdale, uh, and we're very avid recreational fishing and we fishers, and we support American commercial fishing. And by addressing this global problem of IU fishing, it's going to level the playing field for American fishermen. So it's a great thing to do. Thank you for your time. Thank I'm you. I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, thank you very much for that overview, Admiral Gallaudet. Um, I would like to invite the audience to uh, post any questions you might have in the Q&A box. I'm going to start off with one. Um, so you highlighted um, in your presentation uh, what I would call very large, large scale bad actors. Um, we know that the scale of IUU fishing uh, is from very large, but also um, going down to, to very small. And we'll hear a little bit about uh, different um, uh, 
uh, aspect of, of small IEU fishing from our next speaker. Um, where do you see some easy opportunities where the private sector can be most effective in getting engaged uh, in this challenge? Right, I, thanks Sheila. I think the private sector has enormous opportunity and much to contribute uh, both at this global level, which I talked about, but also at the local and regional level. And in fact, the example I provided uh, with the, the fisheries management uh, agencies in Thailand, uh, that, that's really one of those examples. It's very regional, it's very local in, in the region that they're combating the illegal fishermen in Thailand. And I think that's it is by when, when the private sector can partner with NGOs who are really good at hyper local engagement, I think that's where uh, a lot of successes can be made. Okay, um, so we have some questions in the Q&A. Let me combine a couple of them and ask about some examples of success, uh, enforcement actions, um, either domestically or internationally. Okay, examples of success. Well, uh, that, that's, that's interesting because I think NOAA as a national agency combating illegal fishing with partners in the Coast Guard and in, um, and in the Navy have had a number of examples of success that I'm most familiar with. And in fact, uh, NOAA has a very small team in their fisheries called the Office of Law Enforcement. And I track this often, but they, are, they were constantly pursuing in the Pacific illegal fishing activity in, in around the Hawaiian Islands. And so there are, uh, they're just an, uh, every year we were making, uh, we were making successes, not only against China, but against Russia fishermen going into the Alaskan uh, exclusive economic zone. So just in the last year, we, we've made um, arrests and prosecutions of illegal fishers in those regions. And that's why that Solomon uh, uh, press release, Solomon Islands press release was so concerning is if we can give NOAA and our Coast Guard partners access to go pursue with our partners this illegal fishing, it's going to be a problem. Okay, um, thank you for that answer. Um, we have a couple questions that ask about um, non-US nations and conservation. I'm going to uh, hold off on those questions until our next speaker, um, but Admiral Gallaudet, um, so something that you've brought up several times, obviously, is you know, regulators and governments and policy. And um, a question that someone might have who thinks they have a technology solution or is interested in developing a solution would be, do I have to work with regulators or governments? Um, what are some entry points how um, a private entity might, might get involved? The answer is yes. Uh, if you want to do it well, uh, you, know, you have to have permits, of course, and you have to work with regulators. In fact, um, I think the answer is within any given agency, there are, uh, you know, the, 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 like NOAA fisheries, for example, uh, those are the folks to work with. And it's just key, the, it's sort of the answer to your question, Sheila, is yes, is that yes. you, have to, you have to work with national fisheries management authorities if you wanna get good work done. But the great thing is the US really is a world leader in doing this. And in fact, we, we the U.S. has, a, through NOAA, has a very active international engagement um, uh, capacity. And uh, in fact, uh, Dr. Kelly Crick is leading international fisheries at NOAA. And she's, uh, and I met with her. And, she, and so NOAA, NOAA has shown great leadership in this area. In fact, Celeste LaRue, who's going to follow me, also has great experience in this area when she was with NOAA. So I think going to the U.S. agency that's been a world leader in this and asking for their help uh, is, is really a, a, probably a key first step, whether you're concerned about illegal fishing in US waters or internationally. Okay, and the last question I have is, um, we have a very broad range of attendees on this call. We've got folks from universities, we have folks from NGOs, um, we have a, a range of, of US and um, other governmental uh, organizations um, on. How do you see the sectors working together in this? Do you, do you have a sense in your head of you could set people up in a way that based on your experience is uh, maximally efficient for accelerating that technology adoption? What would that look like? Oh, I do, Sheila, thank you. And I absolutely, combating IE fishing is a team sport. And I've seen great contributions of people working together 
like this. Academia usually bringing together advanced science and analytics as well as technology. For example, using aerial drones or satellite image processing like I showed. A lot of that's happening in academia. Uh, the NGOs, as I mentioned, they have great partnerships and, and provide access to key partners at that local level. And then, of course, uh, the government agencies, NOAA and our partners, they're going to allow us also access to the key international governing agencies and fisheries management, as well as uh, providing us the permitting and access and regulatory top cover if we're doing it in the U.S. So it is absolutely a collaborative effort, and I, I can't see it happening effectively, and, and certainly in terms of the scale that's needed without everybody pitching in together and rowing in the same direction. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for that perspective. I think that um, something that, that, you know, a rising tide raises all boats and bringing together, I think folks from 360 degrees around the problem who are all motivated to do something about it is often by far the most efficient way to get things moving and also to identify um, some blockages that maybe if you stay in your sector and you look at it, it doesn't seem like that much of a impediment, but boy, for, for other sectors who are also trying to work in the same area, it can be an immovable object. And I think the more that we exchange information about that, and like you say, all row in the same direction, uh, I think that that lines us up very, very well. So thank you, thank you. very, very much for taking the time to join us today. Um, we have a uh, list of questions that have touched on, um, you know, I'd say the duel of what Admiral Gallaudet shared with us, which was uh, looking at what the U.S. has done from uh, an administration and a governmental perspective on a very large scale. And for this, I'm very, very pleased to introduce our second speaker, who's going to address quite a few of the, po the points that have come up in the Q&As um, around conservation, around uh, nations with fewer resources, and around um, non-US countries. So our second speaker is Dr. Rachel Graham. Rachel is founder and executive director of Mar Alliance. Uh, she works at the intersection of research, environment, and development in Latin America, Africa, and Micronesia. And she spent 30 years living and working in Central America. Uh, she works with the private sector and with institutions that include the United Nations and the Smithsonian Institution. Rachel works with small scale fisheries and other partners to mitigate threats and to create conservation opportunities for threatened marine wildlife and their critical habitats. In 2014, she founded Mar Alliance, which is an international NGO, to promote innovative, impactful, and inclusive grassroots science and conservation of machine, uh, marine wildlife and small scale fisheries. So Rachel is going to speak about the complex interactions between IUU conservation and economic development and share with us some of the unmet technology needs that she has identified that can really facilitate progress in this environment. So Rachel, I'm very pleased to turn things over to you. Sheila, thank you very much. I'll try to do this as best as I can, justice as best as I can. I am just going to um, share my screen with you. I'm gonna go into that, bear with me. Okay, and voila. Okay, can, can you all see the screen? Perfect, Rachel, thank you. L lovely, thank you. So um, thank you very much, Admiral Gallaudet, for, for setting the stage for IUU fisheries. I'm gonna be really focusing a lot on small scale IUU fishing and especially the challenges and solutions surrounding this. Um, uh, small scale uh, fisheries tend to, well, Basically, we're looking at over 100 million people worldwide that are dependent on the small scale fisheries, um, as opposed to the large scale vessels and fisheries that uh, um, Admiral Gallaudet showed in his slide. And they are, they are widespread throughout mostly developing countries. I mean, the FAO stated that 97% of uh, the IUU termed fisheries, um, 120 million in IUU fisheries, 97% of those are in developing countries and are small scale. So um, what are some of the key problems that we're encountering with IUU fisheries? Well, as we know, there's a big focus on the large scale commercial, and so not as much focus on small scale boats. And we're talking, you know, 25, 30, 40 foot boats. And one of the 
big issues that I've encountered in my 30 years in working in this space in Central America, West Africa, and Micronesia is that there is limited registration of these uh, boats of fishers. And for the most part, they're not even tracked. So this means that we often don't know what they're catching. We don't know what they're landing. We don't know what the fishing effort is. Um, in most cases, port state measures don't apply. And another aspect which has not necessarily been captured is that there is a growing lack of confidence in authorities to be able to actually even manage fisheries and have this discourse with small scale fishers and fisheries. And so that has set up a lot of walls and challenges that need to be surmounted as well if we're going to find solutions to, to small-scale IUU fisheries. From my perspective, um, I'm particularly worried about uh, the impact of IUU fisheries on the most threatened species, so the sharks, which are um, sharks, rays, and large teleos or fin fish. And we have seen an over 90% loss of these large predators over the last 50 years. And we need to be able to reclaim those in order to keep our seas as healthy as possible, especially with the coming challenges of climate change. But I think one of the best ways of talking about the challenges we face in you know, trying to protect these large predators, trying to make fisheries sustainable, which is the goal of almost every fisher I have talked to and every fishing community I end up having uh, discussions in, is to give you an example of a small scale fisher and why it's so difficult to try and tackle the small scale IUU fishing um, problem. I'm going to talk about Jose who is a composite of many fishers I've known. He comes from Guatemala. He is in Livingston actually, and two steps from the border with Belize. He fishes with nets and long lines and he earns maybe 10 to $15 a day at most. Um, he never passed second, uh, secondary school. He is medially, um, he is functionally illiterate and he has several children he's trying to get through school. Um, he also is fairly, he's got a strong national pride and he feels that Belize is actually, Southern Belize is part of Guatemala. So we've got that challenge in the international borders. He jumps in his boat with his assistant Arturo and they head off to the nearby Sapodilla Keys in Southern Belize. And there he sets a net, there a bottom net, he catches some rays, he catches a nurse shark, some bonefish, he spears a couple of, of uh, snappers, might pick up a couple of lobsters and conch, and then he thinks he spies the rangers far off. So, and the weather is changing, the weather is not as it used to be, it's a lot more unpredictable than it used to be. So that presents a lot of risks also for small scale fishers. We lose, uh, just so you know, is an estimate of at least 13,000 small scale fishers are lost at sea a year. Um, and he decides to go back home. When he goes back home, he immediately sells the highest price fish and lobsters to a restaurant. He fillets up the rays, keeps some for himself, gives some to Arturo and more. So you'd say, well, what's the problem with that? Well, every single step of the way, it's a case of IUU fishing. It's illegal because he crossed the boundary and he does not have a Belizean fishing permit and he didn't stamp out with his government. It's also illegal because he went to the Sapodilla Keys, which is a marine protected area. And he used gears that are banned in Belize and also additionally in that marine protected area. He caught several protected species, nurse sharks, rays, and even bonefish. And then he took lobster out of season. And when he went back home, there was nobody to record the catch. So the catch was not recorded in Belize and the catch was not recorded in Guatemala either. And um, there might be some regulations in Belize, but those were flaunted obviously, maybe to lack of knowledge, but also because they are not harmonized um, or aligned with laws in Belize either. And there's very little enforcement. You have very few rangers to patrol a 250 kilometers length of Belize's barrier reef against, um, 
against transboundary incursions from Honduras, Guatemala, and even occasionally Mexico. So it's it's hard on both sides of the of um, of the coin. So there are many ways of tackling IUU and uh, even small scale IUU. And, and Admiral Gallaudet mentioned several, um, but. I think one of the first things to do is really put ourselves in the shoes of some of these small scale fishers and see how we can potentially partner with other folks to facilitate any poverty alleviation. I mean, these guys are living on very little and they're forced uh, to go into these small scale fisheries a lot of time because there are no other job opportunities. Um, there's very poor education, a lot on legislation and more, and for them to be able to transition out to other types of, um, of uh, income opportunities, they don't have a lot of business training or leadership training and even, as I mentioned, literacy. So looking for those partnerships, as Gallaudet mentioned, it's really good to be able to work in alliance and in partnership with others whose focus it is to do that. And I, I think this, these are big challenges, but we need to find ways of increasing ownership over marine resources at the local level. And that all of these processes for creating legislation, creating marine protected areas and more are made much more transparent. And throughout all of this, helping the fishers to network and promote horizontal learning and also accountability. And these are, I think, really key ways in which we're going to tackle some of the, these issues. Now, some of the strategies that we've used to reduce small scale fisheries, and these are just the really um, the, the, the head of the pin. Um, everybody knows about area closures, marine protected areas. Uh, we have a 30% of the planet by 30, 2030 as a big UN goal, but you need to do it fairly and equitably. And so again, the whole aspect of transparency comes in. So um, we have smart software. Uh, There's a software that was developed that's open source software to be able to help rangers uh, log enforcement. We There's been use of radar and drones, but they're very costly. They're very limited. They need a land base. So they can't often help with the very dispersed nature of, uh, of small scale fisheries. There have been cell phone trackers used also to assess fishing effort, but it tends to be a one way tracker and not necessarily benefiting the fishers as much as it is enforcement or um, fisheries officers in terms of collection of data on fishing effort. Um, other things that have come up recently, they've shown that lights have reduced bycatch, which is fantastic because um, in many cases, you've got turtles or, or even sharks are bycatch in some of the key IUU fisheries that we've come across. And there's some uh, super digital catch landing uh, efforts being made. Kobe in Mexico has made a, a fisher mediated catch landings app that seems to be working very well and improvements in the DNA barcoding of fish at multiple levels on the supply chain to improve traceability of those fish. So, um, so we do have a great starting point, but we really, really, again, need to think again in terms of a win-win to decrease fishing effort, because this is what we need to do. We have to decrease fishing effort. There's too many of us, there's too few fish, there's too much fishing effort. Um, we need to reduce or phase out unsustainable fishing gears. In uh, 2020, we were part of the first ever national ban on nets that was actually demanded by the majority of fishers in Belize. And we'll see how that might be able to carry over to other countries who want to um, rebuild their fisheries. Education is absolutely critical. We do need to improve the understanding of threatened species and their role in helping fisheries over, uh, overall. And, um, and again, to reduce their capture if we're gonna ensure the sustainable populations for years to come. And I think it's very important too, that we um, monitor, oops, I just slipped, that we monitor um, catches and create jobs. And we don't need external people to do that. We can have people in the communities do that and create the jobs that are so necessary in so many of these communities. In fact, this is where you can really engage women 
and the youth to do the catch monitoring and all the business training and more and it builds skills and it builds trust as well in and transparency in the processes of collecting data and analyzing data and you you then transfer all this information horizontally, and you have those people build the skills horizontally. So with all that said, those that's kind of our approach. That's our ethos. We found that it works uh, quite well, but it's at a small scale. So we need to scale that up considerably. Uh, several organizations have been doing a very uh, similar type of approach and job in their regions. So now we all need to network together in order to um, have economies of scale, and bring um, and and bring lessons learned to each other so that we can improve combating small scale IU fisheries. So one of the big questions that you had um, is what our technology needs. I would say this is my this is my quick laundry list. I've got many others, but one of the first things is we need to have a better handle on. Uh, fisheries data. A lot of it is collected by weight and not by length. And so we can't understand exactly what's happening on the species level and size and, um, and um, populations. So we are really keen to have a smart measuring board and it has to be low cost, it has to be waterproof, it has to be easily uh, created and open access and distributed throughout communities and, and wherever landings are occurring. And then a way to network all that information back to several um, points of, of data collection. DNA barcoding, it's well on its way, doing very well. But we, again, we need low cost. We need it along different uh, levels of the supply chain and readily available, not just for fisheries officers and scientists, but also community and restaurateurs. This is really important. We come across seafood fraud all the time. Um, enforcement of MPAs is becoming more and more fraught and sometimes it actually ends up being dangerous. So one of the ways that we can determine presence or absence of people within an MPA would be using underwater listening ears. So um, any kind of hydrophones that are cued into engine noise and then have a specific signature for the engines. And so we actually know who is coming in and out of those, of those, um, of those uh, marine protected areas. An audio moth is a terrestrial version of that. We'd, look, we'd like a low cost marine version. Uh, uh, the satellite tracker is absolutely critical. Uh, I talked a little bit about that. And then in terms of transparency, it would be great if every country had some form of a like Transparency International, but transparency for marine and fisheries. So working with authorities, but something separate so that we even uh, are able to have people uh, give anonymous tips on illegal fishing activity and so much more. And just make the whole processes of permitting and regulation and everything so much more transparent. So here's the smart fishing board, the smart fish board. This is how we have to measure right now. It's very labor intensive. What we'd like to do is be able to upscale it with AI. So artificial intelligence and machine learning so that we've got all of the species identified. There's Umitron in Japan that's doing this with cage fish, with aquaculture. How can we bring this to the communities so that then we have um, size frequencies and species ID, and then we get an idea of seasonality of fish and fishing uh, at a moment's notice. And as part of that, really rapid digital species recognition. This was just two days ago. Um, one of the fish, fisheries assistants, who's a youth in one of the communities where we work in Hikako in Panama and based in Panama, basically was like, what is this? And it wasn't in the books, it wasn't. So we need better digital species recognition that are readily accessible on the phone. And it's very important for us to have um, this digital catch logs as well, because it will help them to sell their fish better. And in doing so, when they sell their fish, they also want to make sure that they can combat fraud. So that low cost, easy DNA barcoding, which will, and we came across seafood fraud just in having lunch uh, two days ago. So we want to improve traceability of the fish. And these are the supporting enforcement, little audio moths underwater. And I'll just mention um, in the last two, the last two slides, 
We need the small scale trackers that also, also benefit fishers. I just want to mention this is Zé Luis Montero in Cape Verde. We lost him to the sea five months ago. If he had had an emergency beacon tracker on his boat, not just something that would collect where he went, we would know where he went down and we probably could have saved him, but we lost him. We lost him and two colleagues. So all I would say is you need to engage locally. You need to build the bridges between authorities and communities. NGOs are really good folks to be able to do that. You need to seek out those win-win strategies to combat IUU and in return, improve the safety of fishers, create jobs, improve ownership over fisheries. And so I, you know, I invite you to contact us Talk to us a little bit about low cost energy, I mean, low cost tech solutions that you can develop with us and the communities we work with. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Rachel, for um, so much information in that with regard to really understanding uh, almost the dual challenge from what we heard from Admiral Gallaudet with the large scale challenges. Uh, people who are trying to make it in the world and feed themselves and how do we make that, um, allow people to do that while at the same time maintaining uh, the fisheries for generations to come and also preserving and uh, conserving all of the megafauna. Uh, so I, I'm going to start off and address a question that showed up in the Q&A, because Rachel, I know this is something that you and I have spoken about quite a bit. Uh, the question being, um, you know, how do you keep costs down when doing this? And I think what I'd like to share with everyone is this is exactly our motivation for hosting this webinar series. Um, you know, I think as good engineers, for those of us on the call who are engineers and technology people, um, you know, anybody can build a solution with a million dollars that's going to cost a million dollars. It's optimizing it and working within constraints and coming up with a solution that is scalable and suitable to the target market. Um, that's really the, the secret, uh, I think, to good engineering and to good product market fit. Um, additionally, I would challenge the technologists on the call to think about uh, adjacent markets. So now you know what some of the problems are very specifically in combating IUU fishing on the small scale, which as we learned uh, is 30% of the challenge worldwide. Um, but what are some underlying platforms or other applications that can be pursued in parallel that would allow um, satisfying of some of these requirements as well? So Rachel, I do wanna um, uh, give you the chance to offer, uh, answer one question, which I think given, you know, I've learned so much in speaking with you over the years about technology needs and the challenges and, you know, really getting that boots on the ground perspective. Um, you know, you, you mentioned generically, reach out to NGOs and reach out to people on the ground. Where should people start? They can reach out to you. What are some other organizations that you would recommend that people who are interested in learning more about specifics of what's needed and how it might be implemented and what some of the constraints are, who should they talk to? Well, there's a super organization called Too Big to Ignore. So tbti.org, I would highly recommend. Um, and they agglutinate several other organizations that are much larger NGOs and entities. I'd say that they're a very good, a very good starting point if you're looking for a higher level entree. If you specifically want to work in a country that you hold near and dear, like I'm in Panama right now, or for example, Belize or Honduras or Cape Verde, um, you know, uh, talk to us. We can put you in touch also with other actors uh, whom we work with in those countries, and then look at boots on the ground solutions for the small scale fisheries, but TBTI is a really good start. Okay, well, Rachel, thank you. Thank you so much. And to everybody, um, you know, also feel free to reach out to us at Triple Ring. You can use the contact us page. You can email me, contact me on LinkedIn, and I'll be more than happy to connect you um, with other organizations as well. So one of the uh, technology needs that, that Rachel mentioned was DNA barcoding for the seafood, seafood supply chain. And our third speaker today uh, is going to provide us with um, information about an innovative software solution for the seafood supply chain. Uh, our final speaker is Celeste LaRue. And 
Uh, Celeste um, founded Virgil Group in 2020 after 12 years of experience advancing environmental policy in DC with the federal government. So at the White House Council on Environmental Quality, she oversaw the Presidential Task Force on Combating IUU Fishing and Seafood Fraud. And then she led the design, development, and implementation of the US Seafood Import Monitoring Program at NOAA from 2016 to 2020. Her company, Virgil Group, is on a mission to end the global trade of illegally harvested natural resources, starting with seafood. So I'm going to turn things over to Celeste to tell you a little bit more about some of the cool stuff she's doing. Okay, I've unmuted myself successfully and you can see my screen, thanks. Uh, yeah, so nice to be here. Great to have those foundational talks from Admiral Gallaudet and from Rachel. Um, this is a young startup, but it's been a fun journey getting here. As you heard already, there are so many tendrils to combating IUU fishing. I'm not going to do another review talk. I'm gonna just talk to you about what I've been working on, what our company has been building as one way to get our hands dirty and try to solve this problem as best we can. So we're gonna focus on seafood supply chains specifically. Um, we've talked a little bit about the problem, but I think it's worth reiterating here that illegal fishing has these broad tendrils of impact. There are ocean impacts, there are the lives of people who are drawn into illegal fishing, and then there's the fact that if you don't pay your taxes, you don't pay for permits, etc., you are an unfair competitor to everybody who's trying to play by the rules. And this is the area where I focused most of my time, because we learned a little bit today about what it takes to try to catch illegal fishing on the water. That's extremely challenging, as the Admiral mentioned. Uh, it's also really hard to catch it once it's entered a supply chain. And that in part is because of how widely traded seafood is. It is it has the most complex supply chains of any food commodity. Uh, much of it in major market states like the United States, Europe, Canada, it's imported. And uh, we have extremely diverse supply chains, meaning that they a product might move through a certain processor, wholesaler, retailer, cargo ship one day, but that doesn't mean that that exact supply chain is going to just continue, continue on exactly as it was indefinitely. So these are the problems that we're facing and where we are right now is kind of an interesting spot. So governments really around the world, I've put a few flags on the side as examples, are increasingly requiring or putting regulations in place around seafood legality. Um, this is an area where I did some work and our focus was on trying to demonstrate legality through traceability requiring a bunch of data about the harvest and delivery of that seafood to port and following that seafood through the supply chain to prove that it was legally harvested. That is a very, very difficult challenge. And we are seeing industry broadly move toward digitization. As Rachel mentioned, there are many, many hiccups to that that we're gonna kind of go over with our solutions, but it is a trend of the future and one sort of anachronism that I want to point out, which I continue to find interesting, is that consumers, if you go to the grocery store, you're probably not going to see a bunch of detailed information about where your seafood came from. You're going to see it marketed as sustainable. And that comes from third party certifications. There is no formal international government definition of what sustainable seafood is. So every time you see that label on a product, the person who made that label, the entity that made that label, defined sustainability themselves. Uh, I think that we will be well served to focus on data and legality, and uh, that's what I am focused on. So I want to give you a sense, you know, as we start drilling down into what traceability really means in practice. I've helped companies uh, deal with audits that they're getting from the government, and I can tell you from my own experience that it is a very, very messy tangle of physical records, scanned records, digitized information, often in multiple languages, many, many different formats, and it makes it incredibly difficult to do anything productive with this information. So I wanted to ask myself, 
what can I do? How can I use this experience? And how can we build software that can do two really important things? Help open markets for these fishers who are playing by the rules and give them the access that they deserve. And how can we help close those markets to illegal seafood? So if these foreign governments have import restrictions for legality, then that means that in the best case scenario, you're catching illegal seafood before it enters a foreign market. At that point, the damage is done. The fish is out of the water. Whatever happened in the course of that you know, illegal fishing trip has already occurred. And maybe the fish will be destroyed. Maybe it'll be eaten by somebody else. But what we really want to do is empower buyers to not buy that product in the first place and try to eliminate the incentive to buy that seafood. Um, so the first problem that we are trying to tackle is clean data. There is this movement towards digitization, but even digitized information is often really, really difficult to analyze. And that's because there are many different standards. So if you wanna report, for example, what species of fish you caught or what type of fishing gear you used or where you caught that fish, you could use the scientific name of the species. You could use a common name. You could use a um, three letter code that has been assigned by an independent body to track all of the different species. For a fishing area, you know, you might have a specific latitude and longitude location, but regulations really only look for broad areas in which you were fishing. What's the name of the exclusive economic zone, the nation's waters in which you were fishing, or the international waters that you were fishing in? Um, there needs to be a more error resistant streamlining of this data. And that's what we focused on with Boathouse. So we just spun it up this year and we took the data that's required for international trade and just put it into a very error resistant, seamless interface so that if you are trying to digitize information, uh, we've made it pretty easy to enter information in a way that can be read. And then we do all of the translation that's necessary for integrating that data into, let's say, a traceability provider system, or if you just need to send all of this information as a PDF to your domestic government agency, you can do that. If you want to provide this uh, in transparency and do a limited data set as a public reporting function, that's great. We can help with that as well. And to the access point that Rachel meant, uh, mentioned, I feel very strongly that digitization should not be the barrier to markets. It should be people following the rules. And for that reason, we're making this digitization service freely available to fishers all over the world. And if you can digitize your data, we hope that we can help you get new market access because that data, once it's clean and digitized, can be analyzed and can help you through your supply chain. So speaking of analysis, that's the second problem that we are focused on and why we built Seafood Check. So once you have all of this important data about how seafood was harvested and where and when, it's very difficult then to suddenly know, okay, this is a fish harvested in this location using this fishing gear. How do I, as a random seafood buyer, let's say, know that this was fine or that this presented some risk? That requires real analysis of data. And what we've built is a platform that can check for the accuracy of the vessel, the fishing location, the fishery, and the permit. Uh, so briefly, just to tell you in sort of a broad brushstroke what we do is you can enter this information either manually or through an API if you already have a digitized system. And we'll simply run a check on that in this very you know, broad example case, not real. Um, we're saying, okay, yes, there is a yellowfin tuna fishery that's caught by long line. Vessels are flagged from Taiwan from this, and it, it can be caught in this area, this latitude and longitude, this reported ocean area by the FAO. However, you put vessel identification information here that matches a vessel that's on a blacklist, meaning it has been internationally recognized as illegally fishing. This is something that we would want the buyer, we would want any regulator to have readily available to them. But right now, all of this reference data is scattered across the world. Um, for example, the big database that we've built of legal fisheries really doesn't exist anywhere else. 
So we're excited to be able to provide this service. And we're pilot testing now, uh, looking for people who want to grow with us. Um, so I'll sort of transition to my bottom line here. I want to make the point that I really believe that digitization and clean digitization of data can help to remove bad actors from the supply chain and can help open good markets, uh, new markets for good actors. I also want to stress that risk analytics is becoming the expectation. And for that, we need to really focus on responsible digitization and traceable supply chains. And our company is trying to do what we can to help with that. Um, I also want to stress that you know there aren't a lot of for-profit small businesses trying to do this. I haven't found another one that's trying to do exactly what I am. And I do believe, and I set up our company this way because I believe that it's worth the effort. I think that creating these solutions does not need to live in the nonprofit world. I think we can do good for business. I think we can do good for the environment by building something that in industry is incentivized to use because it helps them do their job. Uh, if you're interested in working in this space or you already do and want to learn more about us, please go ahead and check out seafoodcheck.com. You can look at Boathouse, you can schedule a demo with us, and you can certainly contact me. That's my talk, Sheila. All right, Celeste, thank you very much. And um, what a nice, very, very specific example of, um, I think, a very unique solution in this space. So um, we'll open things up for questions. So I'm going to start off and ask you the question that I think I, I, I asked the you know, last year this time, almost when uh, when I first got introduced to the virtual group. So um, blockchain seems to be the answer to all things traceable. And if somebody says, well, gosh, you're building a whole platform here, isn't blockchain just the answer to all of this? Now, um, even if one puts a little bit more constraints around the question to make it more reasonable, um, you know, tell us why, you know, why is blockchain not the be all end all on this? Or why are you not using it? Well, we're not a traceability provider, but I think a couple of uh, glasses of wine deep into our meeting last year, I said something like a traceable lie is still a lie, <laughs> right? Which is true. If you have bad data that goes into a very locked down traceability system, it doesn't somehow make that data true. You still have to check that information and see if it makes any sense. Um, that's why we're eager to work with blockchain companies. We're happy to help them and help their providers check their data through our analytics system. Um, but just having a traceability system and just having it be blockchain does not itself make the information that that contains more accurate. You still have to check that information. And like I was saying, the digitization process really doesn't lend itself to accuracy right now. So there need to be tools on the market that help streamline that process and harmonize those requirements across different users. All right, so the short answer might be garbage in, garbage out, right? One can build a blockchain solution, but it's only as good as what goes into it and, and, and otherwise it may not be useful. Um, so we have a couple questions that have asked about um, standardized import control schemes. Um, and uh, how might this impact the fishing industry? Um, how might it, uh, uh, if there's also other requirements for information to be in digital format? And I think given your history with uh, the federal government, you probably have some thoughts on this. Yeah, so there are um, quite a few public and industry calls to start standardizing these requirements. There are several, I, I can think of probably seven off the top of my head, government, US government agencies that have some kind of data requirement for seafood, uh, depending on exactly what it was, what product form it's coming into the United States in. And those requirements are all scattered across the map. So if we even just take one country's requirements, there still is a lot of diversity in what data is required and in what format. And standardizing and streamlining those requirements will make it a lot easier for industry to comply and for everybody to do better risk analytics of that information. So I'm fully in support of harmonization. The other thing I say to folks who bring this topic up is we have to keep in mind that different governments are bringing up this issue for different reasons. So Admiral Galliadad had a specific use case for the United States and why we need to do this. Um, the European catch certification system, for example, 
only applies to wild caught seafood. It does not apply to aquaculture at all. But the U some of the US programs do cover aquaculture. So there are big scope misalignments, and then there are tiny, many, many tiny data misalignments. And I think that both of those can be addressed, but I feel like the data is the lowest hanging fruit here to take one of your themes from a previous uh, question. Right, right, okay. Um, so uh, I'll just give one more call out if we have any more questions. Um, Rachel, maybe you can rejoin us on video. I'd like to take the opportunity to thank both of our speakers that are still with us and Admiral Gallaudet who is not with us. Uh, and also um, the audience for the um, spirited questions. And uh, clearly people were intaking um, what was going on and reacting. Uh, again, if anybody has follow-up requests, um, you've gotten contact information for Celeste. Um, I'm more than happy to pass on contact information as well. Please feel free to reach out to us at Triple Ring. And um, again, thank you both very, very much for providing such nicely uh, complementary perspectives on the problem and solutions. And I look forward to seeing things out of both of you uh, in the future on this issue. And hopefully we can come up with a way to work together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sheila. All right, thanks everybody. And with that, uh, I think we'll conclude our webinar.